Okay, hello, hello, everyone. Uh, latest session slot. Still a lot of exciting faces, so cool. If you're interested in developer docs, uh, without an introduction um, given for me, I'm Johannes. Uh, I like to eat a lot. Uh, that's why I also work out, so I can eat a lot and don't get fat. Um, in then I have a family. I try to take care of them as much as I can. And when I'm at work, I'm a developer advocate and trying to improve the developer experience for our product. And the developer experience for our product is at the moment mainly improving our docs for one and a half years, a little bit more than one and a half years. And this talk is the combined learnings of one and a half years improving our docs to a state where I would say now they're actually usable, so they help users for our product. I work fully remote uh, in the attic, second floor, and the cool thing about working fully remote is I can go down and see my kids once in a while. And I came down when they had vacation, and my little one, my, my little daughter, she's nine now, tried to learn crotcheting. And if you ever tried it, who had tried crotcheting before? Ah. One, one. I, I did it a lot because I one, once uh, had dreadlocks and needed a cap. And yeah, if you think about it, it's a very finicky thing to learn. You have this thread and it's wrapped around your left finger and you have to have the right tension there and you have this strange needle that gets caught up in the, in, the th in the thread and all the things you have to take care of. So if you're just learning out, this is actually a hard thing to do. And she was sitting there nearly in tears, but very enraged because she watched a YouTube tutorial, there are a lot of them out there, uh, that tried to teach her crotcheting. And I asked, yeah, what, what's wrong? You're just trying to learn something which is very difficult if you're just trying out. And she said, yeah, it just doesn't work. I tried it three times, the right steps that were given in the tutorial, and it didn't work. So, okay. Yeah, maybe the tutorial is wrong, I watched it. And there was uh, one thing. There were two steps missing in the tutorial. I knew because I know how to crush it, uh, this, this pattern. Yeah, so if you have the wrong documentation for your product, this time the crotcheting, then your product doesn't work. So documentation makes or, break, uh, makes or breaks your product. There's also a book about this, which, uh, which uh, is called The Product is Docs, because without docs, your product is nothing. It's not usable. And there was another thing. Then I said, yeah, that's, that's uh, obvious that you can't finish this pattern. And then she said, very enraged, my daughter, yeah, but th she said, it's easy. Yeah, of course it's easy if you've done it 100 times, but if you're just starting out, no, nothing is easy. And that's the same with the your developer docs. When someone is starting out with your product, yeah, nothing is easy. Yeah. And we will take these two points, so how to create a good documentation, a user product, uh, product documentation for your, uh, for your product, and also how to tackle the second thing, that you don't tell your users ever to say something is simple or easy or just do this, yeah. Um, yeah, this can be done with technical things like linting. So we will cover both things. So for me, pro, uh, developer docs are the most important thing when it comes to a product. Okay, it has to be usable, but uh, the developer docs come rightly after, they are intertwined. But if you don't take it from my personal experience, there are a lot of surveys. I pulled out this one from slash data, they ask 100, no, uh, 70,000 developers from 145 uh, countries, what's the most important resource to learn a new product, a new technique, a new framework? And they all said, yeah, documentation is the single most important resource to developers. There's also another survey from GitHub, also the same finding. The most important resource is documentation. So, you can take it or, or leave it, but that's confirmation for me. So, we started out uh, 
with ASCII here, our documentation uh, on the right side, where we said, yeah, the documentation is only usable if you know TypeScript, if you know the NPM environment and how to set it up. And then you can, when you are lucky, go to the left side. So that's, that's the state of our developer docs. When you're coming from Python or Java, yeah, you're just screwed because you don't know how to use NPM because there was also an error in the onboarding. <laughs> yeah, not so, not so well done. We, um, who knows the Stripe docs? One, one, two, two, more. Basically, everybody who, who, who searches for great developer documentation stumbles over the Stripe docs. This is a very high bar. Uh, you don't have, you, you mustn't go that, uh, you should not have to go that far to get your product usable. But uh, one thing about the Stripe docs is they interactive. I think the Grace also showed uh, in her session here, like it's interactive, you have a VS Visual Studio code, you have the documentation, you can run it on the right side and, and try stuff out, that's, that's really cool. It's also custom built, so they wrote their own documentation framework, so a lot of work got uh, put into these docs, so you don't have to go that far. I will show you how you can get there easier. But there are also uh, good examples, and if you want to look at a few developer portals and also developer documentation, there's the Pronovix Best Developer Portals Award. These are examples from the 2022 report. There's also a 2023 report now. And one of the things that, that really is developer documentation is Ivan. And they had a huge effort over, I think, two years to all get all the information together in this developer portal, which is also used in the API SDK. So it looks <laughs> simple, but it's actually a huge effort they put into this. So I said already that our docs were barely usable. And of course, I have an example. So when I started out, uh, the first task was to, hey, get, get, set, uh, get our product set up on your machine. And I went to the docs, and this is what greeted me. And I thought, yeah, cool. I re read that already on the website. So when a developer comes to you and clicks on your documentation, they don't want to see the same features iterated again. So this is already, we have already had some drop off here. And then you go to getting started only to be greeted with the same features again. Yeah, still no way on how to get started. And it's another funny thing here. You don't have any indication, only on the bottom right here, what you actually should do now. How do I get set up with Ask UI? Yeah. There's a few other things here I, I want to point out. When you have crappy documentation, the saving grace for every developer, and you might have noticed it, is a search bar. Yeah? A good search can make up for really, really bad documentation. And we, we didn't have that e either. Do you see any search bar here? Yeah, no, nothing. Yeah, mm -hmm. Cool. Also, the, the API docs, that's the last thing I want to point out here, are very cool. So we have all these click events. So Ask UI is a UI automation framework. And we had this very cool API documentation which said like this. Yeah, what does a click do? It clicks on an element. No examples, no illustration, no show me what, what it's actually doing and how it's done. And all of them were like that, more or less. So cool, really helpful for a developer. Yeah, no. Think about a time you found, a doc found documentation really helpful. And as a developer, these are my, uh, the, the, the best customers when I get called into a sales, sales call, but sales does also a little bit of product. Uh, solution engineering helps our customers set up, and uh, developers, if we get them there in the sales calls, usually you don't get them there, but if you get them there, they usually want, I want to do this, 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 and this. Where are the resources? Send it to me via email, and the next day they call, hey, I set it up, and I also built this and this and this. So you just point them to the right documentation, the right resources, can be blog posts, can be your documentation here, and they just get it. Yeah, that's the, the coolest thing, just send it over and they do it. So when developers come to your documentation, they couldn't care less about the features. They already evaluated 
that your product could solve their problem. So if you're iterating, like we did at the start, all the features again and again, it's basically useless. That's the thing. What they want is, hey, I want to integrate my framework. I did this also with Langchain, for example. So I had an existing application, and I wanted to integrate Olama. And I decided, yeah, Langchain would be cool to try out. And I wanted to integrate this into my application. So what I need as a developer is, how can I integrate Olama into my uh, application? I need a direction. And then I run. That's the thing. So toss all the features aside in your documentation. Focus on the directions. Think about your documentation. Like when I give a new tool to my kids. OK, they are not uh, as young anymore, but when I did it. So think about your documentation. Your documentation is a hammer or screwdriver. So when I give a screwdriver to my to my two daughters and say, yeah, do something with it. And they try to nail something into, like a screw, nail a screw. That's not going to work. So without a manual, without instructions on how to use your product well, they will never get there. So you need an instruction to your hammer to actually hit the nail and do the thing your product needs to do. So. I didn't have any formal training in, in technical writing, uh, so I did what I thought was best for our documentation and came up with a version 2. You already noticed we got rid of the <laughs> sense senseless uh, reiteration of features. The next thing we did was, okay, we don't need to iterate again and again on the features. We just want our users to get in the Getting Started Guide again. And this is what we did provide something very fast. If you can do this with your, uh, with your product, provide something like Gitpod. If it's a web thing like for Vue.js, for example, you can also use StackBlitz, which is extremely fast. It's WebAssembly. Um, so s nobody has to install anything if they just want to try out your product. That's the, basically the fast path, path you can take. If they want to automate their use case on, on their data, then you have to do local installation. So we provided this again. That's what we did. And if you pay attention, we also have a search bar. Finally, we can search something. Problem there is, um, I, I can show it right now because it's a uh, development mode, but it searched over all versions. We had like 20 versions and you couldn't find anything, but we had a search bar, yeah? Um, we also try to include more structure. Like, okay, we have a start, we have installing ASCII, uh, and write your first instruction. We also have guides. Continuous integration is something you do, of course, with a product like ours. Um, the wording got a little bit more um, fixed. Then I come from software architecture, and we have a lot of specific UI workflow automation terms. We also have a terminology there. That's something like you do in ARC 42 with a glossary. So there's a lot of uh, terminology here. We expanded our troubleshooting because we're working on the operating system of the user, which is harder than doing some, something like SaaS. And we also created more tutorials. And for our API, we did something like this. You could search all the things. And I was very proud of this at the time we, we provided this. We had some more documentation. We had some explanation on what this actually doing. And we had, not at all, we also had GIFs on what is actually happening with the code. So this is already much more useful for a new user. It's not perfect. But it's a start. So then I got a little bit stuck and thought, yeah, what should I do? Should I make this more beautiful? And I think I already said you need directions. You need something solved. Beautiful, in my opinion, is a very personal opinion and uh, op opinionated. Maybe you can prove me wrong. Stripe docs are very beautiful, but that's uh, more or less for me uh, icing on the cake. I think beautiful depends on usefulness. Who knows this documentation? Where does it come from? There are some DevOps people here. Last time someone noticed. Does someone know where this comes from? Yes. Um, 
Before my time as developer advocate and software architect, I actually was in a DevOps team. And we had to configure a reverse proxy. And I used exactly this one pager from Nginx to do it. Because it's not beautiful, but it's extremely useful. I, I still think of this documentation all the time. Because, OK, I want to set up an error page. I Google, uh, I just use the browser search. It's extremely fast, because it's only text and uh, not much HTML. I, go, uh, I search for error code, I get this error page, I see where's the context, where do I put this, I have a nice example and what it actually does. I think most beautiful documentation ever for me, because I only needed this site to do what I needed to do. Cool stuff. So beautiful is more like design follows function. If it does its job, it's beautiful. But if you want to look at really beautiful and minimal docs done, um, I would recommend looking at the docs, uh, Empathy Docs. That's an e-commerce search plugin, I think. And they have this minimal design. And you see here, this is the architecture. And you can zoom in here and say, OK, what's this microservice, microservice thing doing? That's a little bit small. And here's the fun thing. You can even click on the specific microservices. So let's say if, if you get to this level of graphical design and usefulness, that's cool. But you don't, you, you, it's not important that you get there. Developers will, will just use your documentation if it's useful. OK, with that in mind, we did another version. So we are in version 0.12.2 now from 11.0.11.3. And I thought, yeah, the structure needs a little bit. It should be better, actually. And what you can see here now is that we have uh, the getting started is a little bit rewritten. We still, we added something like how AskUI works, because there are a lot of terms there and how they work together. Um, is important, but only for someone who says, OK, that's the right thing. How do I set it up and, and all, the, all that stuff? And also completed the onboarding already. And then we said, OK, what are we actually about? We are actually about element selection and clicking on stuff and all that stuff, all the things. So we added a, something like element selection, which is still a little bit a problem here because it has more than five entries. If you're, if you're getting into psychology on how to structure things, it's very important to know that everything over five items in a menu is really hard for users to grasp. That's because uh, everything more than five is just doesn't fit in our head. There are some people who can fit seven to nine. There's also a, a really funny correlation uh, with the size of DevOps team. And some psychological studies even say, Three is the maximum. So you have to keep your menu items as short as possible, because everybody will stop reading after here, like after tables. That's basically what, what happens. And we did something on the tutorials thing, also the troubleshooting. That's what we did. So it's, it, it was a little bit better, but still not good enough. And then I bought some technical writing books and thought, yeah, and ask myself, is this useful from a technical writing perspective? Yeah. What are the others doing all the time? What are the others, other platforms doing? And I noticed something uh, what was also present, and also from our sales call. So we got some qualitative data on what our users would actually do with UI, UI automation. And they said, we're coming from testing space, we're coming from RPA space, we have some users who just want to automate, like with a no-code editor, and not like a real coder, I would say. And we noticed, yeah, we needed a workshop on how to define our personas. So what I also would recommend, if you if you're can talk to your sales department, you talk to your founders, um, get qualitative data what your customers who are interested in your product actually do. And then we found out, yeah, we had like four personas, and we can serve three at the moment. And we have to structure our documentation, 
I would call it segmentation. I, I'm not sure if that's the, the right term here, but uh, that's the best term I could come up with. We have to structure our documentation into segments. Like every developer portal in the Pronovix developer uh, award does. Like you see here, I don't know what platform it does, uh, does actually, but they're doing exactly this segmentation. So they have a get started for new users. Besides that, they also have a great uh, search here. They have a developer guide. They have an API reference guide for more experienced users. They also have best practices for more experienced users. And they have use cases if somebody wants to see what can I actually do with this. And you see these different segmentations already. Did you know that 50% uh, of the APIs, I'm not sure if it's, it's still this, but it was a few years ago, that 50% of APIs are actually used by business people, not developers? That's, that's an interesting fact. So the API reference caters to a different audience also. There's another example, AB and Amro. I think they're doing something with FinTech. They also have API documentation, how to get started for developers, and also developer blog for developers. So that's their audience. So they provide on the starting page the directions for the different personas. That's the important part. So how do you get to the different personas? You can <laughs> take qualitative data. And the best thing is talk to your customers, find out, out what their goals are. And these are called user goals. And these user goals have a definition that they're rooted in the real world. So nobody comes to you, yeah, I want to try out your product because UI automation is cool. What they actually want to do is like, I have this Android device and I have a browser application, I have a desktop application, and I want to automate all these three devices. Or I just want to automate a Windows phone. Or I want to automate a native Mac OS app. That's a real world goal. And then you can define your user goals and structure your documentation with this. And we came up with these are not very interesting, but that's what our users actually wanted to achieve here. So a lot of users came to us and say, yeah, we have this Android device and we automate, want to automate this Android device. That's a user goal. Or a lot of people came from testing and they usually have Windows applications they need to test and automate. They said, okay, we want to automate a native Windows application or a native macOS app. That was not as often. So, how do you come from a user goal to actually writing documentation? So now you have these basic categories, we will see them in the documentation later, but how do we actually structure our documentation that a user can achieve their user goals? And this is where learning objectives, this is a, a formal term in technical writing, come, come into play. Those are intellectual goals. We will see some examples there. But the important part is thus that learning objectives usually consist of one site or one page in your documentation. So one learning objective is one place where you store this information about these learning objectives. And you need two, three, four, five, sometimes more, to actually implement a user goal. So that's very theoretical. Let's come up with some um, example learning objectives we came up to. And we will also see what uh, structuring your documentation like this has, uh, has advantages. Example learning objectives come into three different flavors. There are def de three different um, categories, you could say. And there's first the applicable skill. So the user should be able to connect our software with their device. That was one learning objective. Device means Android device here. Could also be a Windows device. So this would be another learning objective. So this is an applicable skill. There's, there's nothing involved like, okay, we automate. It's just like connecting our, our product with their device. Then the next thing is we want to do some UI workflow automation. So usually this is based on text. That's what we found out. So the most <laughs> thing is there. We want to click on this text. We want to extract some text. So for this, a user needs to be aware what is actually possible to do with a text like clicking on it, and there are different ways to select a text. If you have a long text, you might use a regex, or you need, need an exact or a similar thing, uh, text matching algorithm, and you need to be aware of this. 
because if you don't be a, if you are not aware, you can't use it. So this is the second category. And then that's the comprehension part. So you want to select a text in a specific scenario. You have to comp have to have the comprehension. That's the third category on what text selection method is the best in your specific scenario. And if you have these three things minimum, you can actually achieve a user goal. Depends on how you look at it. So one user goal, many learning objectives. That's the, the learning here. And coming up with learning objectives is sometimes hard. You have to put a lot of effort in it because you have to make them short enough and bordered enough that you don't bleed into other learning objectives. So let's go to the Ask Your Docs again. So this looks already completely different. You also see we have uh, six more versions now. And this is how our users are now greeted. And I think that's, that's still the case. You see, OK, we still have the quick start with Gitport. That, that's cool and all. And then we have Windows automation. We have Android automation, Mac OS, and Linux automation. So if somebody comes to us and says, hey, I want to, want to do Windows automation, then they click on the Windows automation, of course. And we also found out that we have a lot of enterprise users who works in the enterprise environment, proxies, and all that, that funny thing. A lot of people, I guess. Um, yeah, we have an enterprise checklist because you usually don't get fully administratable machines here. So, so we have the segmentation done here. So the next thing we want to do is to look at, okay, how do our learning objectives actually look like? And we have guides now, and you see we only have five entries here, and we have how to select elements. And you see they're very specific. So we have recommended practices, we have custom elements, we have text selectors, also select elements by proximity. This is relational selectors, like an element is right of another element. So you see these very, very compact um, learning objectives, all encapsulated in one specific, you can also click on this. So there's nothing more in here than selecting something with a relation. This doesn't bleed into another learning objectives. When you come from software architecture also or software development, learning objectives is more like modules because you don't want your modules to have a separation of concern. You just want your module to be encapsulated. This module does one thing. If you need another module to do a user goal or you need a prerequisite, you can say, okay, look at this page, complete this page first, then do our uh, do this learning objective. Because what we found out when we tried to teach our users Android automation, and then we have to go back to the to an earlier version. So we had these tutorials. So we had this old automate multiple devices. What happens if you don't do learning objective separation? then you have something here, like in Automate Multi-Devices, there's an Android only, so you have to do something with Android. And then we also have another learning, another page, which is setting up Android devices, and then we have Web Search on Android. And also we have Flutter Sample Android app. And the fun thing was is that we had a lot of documentation duplicated or even tripled. And <laughs> like in software development, if you duplicate code, or in this time documentation, it just gets outdated in very strange ways. And depending on the path our users took through the documentation, if they actually found it, they got stuck or they got it to work. So yeah, that's not cool. So what we did in the final, in the final iteration was, OK, we have this uh, guides. And then we have automating mobile devices, and there's the Android, how to set up Android and iOS. And automating multi devices, there is nothing in there with Android. Oh, prepare your Android device, yeah. Yeah, we still have it in there, so I have to remove it. So, but it's only there. So, separating your learning objectives gives you the peace of mind that you only have to maintain one set of documentation and don't have to look other ways.
So let's come to the technical part on how we actually build documentation. Um, OK, you structure it like this, user goals, derive learning objectives from it. OK, beautiful. We will see how, how that works out, if it's good, en good enough. And then what we do, because we're very developer-focused, I'm, I'm happy about that. We don't have more sales people than engineering. <laughs> so we, I think we're currently 22 people in our startup, and we, I think we, already, we, we still have 15 engineers. So that's, that's cool. And engineers don't uh, like to use something like Confluence. Who uses Confluence? <laughs> do you like it? <laughs> no, um, me neither, me neither. So. Good company. Um, we use Docs as code. A lot of people know this already, but uh, I want to re reiterate on the things I find uh, most interesting in Docs as code. Um, actually, they are easy to write if you're not using something like ASCII doc. This has a little bit of a learning curve. We are using Docosaurus here. Uh, and this is Markdown. Markdown is very easy to write. You have good tooling in every editor you use. The cool thing is, Docs is code. You can create pull requests and get your documentation reviewed. Um, the best thing is also to put your documentation where your code is. So if you have a pull request with code and it needs documentation, you can say, hey, documentation is missing. So cool thing. You can use all the tools. We use GitHub. They are also for GitLab. That's every tool uh, supports this. If you are working in a corporate environment that, like I did before, um, there's a corporate CI. Yeah, that's cool. You can generate the job corporate uh, CI without problems with uh, CSS. So no problem there if you need a Word document or a PDF document in a specific style. You have automatic versioning. So if you delete documentation, you can get it back. That's very interesting. I think that's not so <laughs> possible in a wiki. And it's uh, here's WYSIWYG. I, I hate WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Who loves Google Docs and Word? S perfect. Uh, I, I hate it also because every time I create a heading and hit enter, the heading bleeds into the next, next line, and I don't know why. So Docs as code is usually what you see is what you mean. So, uh, this means you say, this is a heading in markup, and the parser does everything for you. Just looks good, so it's easy. What we use is a text stack, and there are a lot of different uh, uh, frameworks out there. We use Docosaurus, generates nicely looking, easily stylable uh, documentation. Then we also use uh, linters extensively, uh, namely Vail, which includes the Alex linter. Vail is not only a language linter like spelling correction and all that stuff, but also prose linter where you can define your own rules. And I hope I get to show this. And Alex is an inclusivity uh, linter, which for me, you, uh, you may have noticed I'm from Germany. I have sometimes strange grammatical sentences, and also uh, I don't know about all the inclusivity language. Like, for example, if you say something in English like, this is big or bigger than something else, this might be offensive in some cases, and I'm not aware of that. Which brings me to my live demo. Well, you have to install it on your machine. I hope this is, should be real. Let's make it a bit bigger. And what you then do is you run the whale command and say which file they should. It should actually lint. And we have some findings here. OK, I put them there at first. OK. And it says you can see, OK, in the file recommended practices, it says, OK, consider removing appears to, appears to, yeah, appears to be appears to be, yeah, it breaks somehow strange. Also, some abbreviations like e dot g dot, which means, for example, may not be so favorable in s because if you're not a natural speaker, you might not know what this means. Um, then we have something like repetition, like if there's a D and another D behind us, this happens very fast if you're just typing and reordering your sentence. Um, and what's special in German, and we ha I, I wrote a special rule for that, in Germany we are told, like, you have to say, you are going to, and then we had an American employer said, your Germans are always so wordy. 
just write you will. And I wrote a specific <laughs> rule for that, that everybody who says you are going to, <laughs> it says, yeah, please use you will. Yeah? And also those weasel words, you can put a lot of them in there. Arguably is a weasel word. If you don't know what a weasel word is, these are all the filler words you usually use in, in natural language, but uh, you don't use them in technical writing. It has to be clear and, and, and simple, simple and, um, yeah, clear and simple and not too complicated so that everybody can understand it. The cool thing about Veil is that you can can integrate it into your complete workflow and your developer workflow. So what we have here is the styles repository, and the styles repository is a symlink. We created an extra style repository for this, put it into GitHub, and then we link it from your local machine. You can also link any zip file here, and we put it in the .github folder because this is where all the um, GitHub stuff uh, lies, and we have a spe special workflow which does not fail at the moment, which is called linting. So, and this executes on all these files only the latest version, the veil command with the styles. So every time someone creates a pull request, or even if you can put this into a git uh, pre-commit hook like Husky, there it's also if you say git commit, it does the linting for you. So everybody gets these warnings and says, yeah, no, no, you have to change this. And the cool thing is if you put this in a GitHub repository, you can use it everywhere. So you can create a style guide. Kamunda did this, for example. They create a style guide for all their documentation and use it everywhere. So this is the power of Docs code and all that comes with it. So how do you actually write this? So you may ask, yeah, I have this specific terminology, like we have ESLint in here. Whale doesn't know ESLint. Um, they have a special vocabulary here, so you put the accept everything, so every terminology you need, like expect all exists. This is a new method. Whale said, yeah, that's, I don't know this. Uh, you can put it in the vocabularies, and it doesn't get flagged. And then you can also write rules like these weasel words. At the moment, it only appears to be, and arguably, because we had a lot in our documentation, I had to do a lot of <laughs> things that not everything gets flagged here. But it's fully extensible. So if you have specific words uh, or you want to change something in your documentation, like saying, OK, appears to be, should be out there, and you can do everything. A little warning, it's often with regex, and there's a saying, if you try to solve a problem with regex, you actually have now two problems. Yeah, so you have to invest a little bit of time. But there are good um, style guides already. For example, Vail has style guides for Google or WriteGood. What we use in our thing is Vail and Alex, this inclusivity um, language linter. And yeah, there you have the phrases, which we use specifically in German because we are taught that way in school you will, and for example, these are things we included here at the moment. There are already a lot of findings, so gradually pump that up, and you will get this. Um, to come back to my first example, I think in the vocabulary, also easy. It's in the accept at the moment. You can say, okay, easy or simple shouldn't be in your documentation, then you put it into reject. And nobody will ever tell my daughter again that something is easy in the documentation. Yeah. So to wrap this talk up, the takeaways from this talk should be developers always come to your documentation with a goal in mind. Never as assume otherwise. I see a lot of Developers writing documentation, and of course, as developers, you want to tell the cool stuff we've done. That's actually not what, you're de what developers using your product would care, care about. They don't want this. They just want a solution to their problem. So think about it. No features, just solutions to their problem. Design follows function. 
opinionated. We can uh, talk about this, but the most beautiful documentation doesn't help it, <laughs> like with my daughter, if there are two steps missing. Yeah, no. Then, talk to your sales department. Talk to your solution architects. What are our users actually trying to achieve and derive, derive the user goals from them? And then, create your starting page, like I did after one and a half years, and say, okay, this is where you need to go to do this and that and that and that. And that is usually the path you should take and then you will have success. Then, user goals are great and all, but without learning objectives, modularizing your documentation, they're actually very they're meaningless. Uh, you have a lot of learning objectives to implement for your user goals, three categories, applicable skills, comprehension, and the third one I was this the third one? Okay, you get it if you, if you look at it. Um, you need a lot of learning objectives, make them modular, so you only have to maintain documentation on one, in one place. And, of course, I have to say this, use docs as code where possible. And I thought a lot of people were actually <laughs> not fond of wikis, so that's okay. Uh, because you get all these benefits um, of using developer tooling, getting code review, and also get the stuff like creating styled documents, all of them. And with that, I will leave you to the keynote and have fun at the conference. Thank you. For your talk. <laughs> Uh, how do you uh, recognize what exactly audience? Because if you want to do segmentation on the documentation level, you need to understand how much you have like business, you say business people also use API or developers or whatever, so how to find this? By like maybe Google uh, Analytics or what? Yeah, if you're big enough, which we are not, uh, then you can do this. You can see how people are using, how users are trying to use your product. Um, actually, it's really where you have solution architects and we also have the sales people who really talk to our developers. And it's always cool as someone who writes documentation to, to talk to them if they are willing. And uh, I think you can learn a lot about the problem space. Uh, yeah, so get qualitative feedback and be noticed, okay, 80% of our users are actually trying to do something with Windows and 10% are doing something with Android and 10% are doing something else. So we know, okay, Windows is very important. Okay, one more question just about feedback. So how do you encourage people give you feedback more? Uh, you, you said solution architect, so the person can go to them and ask if you know your clients, for example, already, but maybe you do something else. Yeah, feedback is uh, a big problem, I think, for everyone. The only thing you can reliably get feedback is paying someone who uses your documentation. Say, we have a $10 uh, dollar Amazon voucher, and you get it if you answer our questionnaire. That's the most reliable thing. Also, you use your own, um, eat your own dog food. So we use our product enough, and uh, oftentimes my, uh, my favorite sales guy comes to me and I'm, I'm trying to implement this, and it doesn't work. And then we look at the documentation and find something. Yeah. Feedback is very, very hard to get. So what you, the, the goal is to actually see uh, something like docs observability. I'm not, not, not sure if that's the right term, but actually see, okay, someone making a call to our API, and then they going to the documentation, and then you can also see, did the documentation solve the problem? Are they getting through with the call? So that, that's the, the goal, but you have to instrument a lot of things. And we're in Germany, so connecting personal data like that is sometimes, uh, yeah, Datenschutzgrundverordnung <laughs> is, uh, is hard. Thanks. Okay, if nobody has a question, um, it's all right, there. <laughs> How about uh, in-house docs? So docs for new, new guys coming in your dev teams? It's a little bit a different audience, I would say. But we use these docs also to onboard new employees because they're working with our product, yeah. 
Um, at my former employee, we used also Docs as code for this. Um, worked great. The good thing about Docs as code is that um, the quality is always higher for the in-house documentation because you have a pull request before you actually push to production. So a lot of people uh, looking at the thing. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, thank you.